Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to my April 2024 reading wrap-up. I am now officially getting a little bit closer because, I mean, at the time of filming it's the 24th of May. Um, but I am getting closer, so without further ado, let's dive into the books. Dane reads. So I read the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. This is a long old one, 800 odd pages. It's Dickens' first book and I have to say you can tell. Um, basically, as is known, in the early days Dickens quite often wrote with newspaper serialisation in mind. It worked better with some of his longer books, but here you can definitely tell that's what he was doing. There are glimmers of genius. Um, and you can see kind of the early signs of a great writer. I think they say like with most writers their first book shouldn't necessarily have been published. And I, I think that's maybe true here. But also it's Dickens. So you kind of want it to have been published because obviously it could be of historical significance. Um, human nature is shown a lot in this and it doesn't really change. The problem is, is that the plot's pretty lacklustre. A lot of what I enjoyed was how the characters interacted with each other rather than anything that actually happened. Um, the backstory behind it is more interesting than the book itself as well. So Dickens was asked to write a novel that strung together a bunch of different illustrations that this guy called Robert Seymour created, and that was how it was born. Uh, they later argued and Seymour shot himself in the head uh, and killed himself. Um, I didn't see any of these illustrations though because I read it via audiobook, so I, I don't really know. But basically the idea is that um, there's a guy called Samuel Pickwick and he creates a club with a few friends. The goal is to travel around the country have some shenanigans and then report back to the others when they get back. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what happens. As I said, I didn't particularly enjoy this one. Um, I'm glad I listened to it via audiobook as well because I don't know if I would have stuck through it if I hadn't. In fact, I've been listening to a lot of Dickens via audiobook lately. I gave The Pickwick Papers, Papers by Charles Dickens a 3 out of 5. All right, up next we have A Slow Fire Burning by Paula Hawkins. Um, I wasn't particularly taken with The Girl on the Train when I read that back in the day, but I did quite like A Slow Fire Burning. Um, it does what you'd expect from a thriller novel. Um, taps into all of those tropes, but has a few other things along the way as well. So, uh, but, uh, some believable characters throughout. I like the fact that it takes place in canal boats, because I've always found them to be like a, an interesting lifestyle choice as well. One of the characters is a writer. We have a bunch of literary references throughout the book, including... Um, you know, that quandary of what to do with someone's books after they pass away. Um, you don't want to just get rid of them all. Um, when I read books like this, I don't tend to think too much about who might have committed the crime, and that was certainly the case here, I was just along for the journey. Um, it definitely wasn't a slow fire burning reading-wise, um, but it also didn't go up in such a blaze that it burned itself out. Overall, it was just a pretty good thriller novel, uh, 3.5 out of 5 from me. Okay, then we have Circe by uh, Madeline Miller. So this is the first time I've read one of her books, uh, although I do want to read The Song of Achilles as well. And I've got to say, I'm pretty uh, pleasantly surprised by this one. Uh, I like mythology as much as the next person, but I wouldn't say I'm particularly au fait with it. I don't know the ins and outs of all of the different mythological systems or anything like that. Um, but I guess that makes me exactly the kind of person this book was uh, written for. Now what's interesting about Cersei is she's a minor goddess, a fascinating uh, character to read about because while she's often overlooked and underestimated, she does shape her own destiny. Doesn't always work out for her, but the important thing is, is that she's a female lead and she manages to find her own agency in a very patriarchal world. I mean, she's struggling both with patriarchy in general and then also the patriarchy within the, the system of gods, you know. I was worried it was going to be overwritten to begin with, but I uh, did quickly fall into it. Uh, Miller got the balance just right between modern storytelling and modern ideas, and like classic storytelling and these bits of mythology that are a thousand years old, making for a surprisingly easy read. Uh, Cersei is a kind of feminist hero, I would say, um, uh, of a type that's pretty popular in modern literature and with good reason. Uh, she has superpowers of a sort, she's kind of like a witch, she can make herbs you know, mix and match them and put them to, to good use. Um, it sometimes works against it, but that's the, the sign of a good magic system, you know, a good magic system. It should be powerful, but also have its drawbacks. Uh, all in all, when it, when, it, when it comes to what I thought of it, I gave it a strong four out of five, did enjoy it. I would have happily have kept reading it if it had kept going past where it went to. All right, then we have The Complete Ankh Morpork by Terry Pratchett, and this is basically just a little supplementary book that sits alongside the wider Discworld books. It's kind of like um, a guide to the city of Ankh Morpork with a bunch of listings of the different, you know, businesses from bakers to brewers to refuse men to restaurants, whatever it might be. Uh, you can't actually go and pay the city a visit, obviously. Um, or as I've written down here, pay the visit a city. I should fix that. Um, but I'm sure if it, if it was possible, this would be a super useful guidebook with you for you to take. Again, it's one of those where reading it, 
it does feel like a chore sometimes because you are just reading like fake fictitious business listings but there are some little goodies thrown in as well some some of that classic Pratchett humor overall I gave it a strong four out of five then we have through the keyhole by Louis Theroux and this one's basically Louis Theroux's diaries that he kept during the COVID-19 pandemic um, while everyone else was learning new skills or getting projects done Louis Theroux was writing in his journal um, Eventually his journals became a book, but don't make the mistake of thinking this is a COVID book because it's much more than that. It does lean heavily on the pandemic to be fair, um, but it's also just quite funny. Uh, like it shows a lot of slices of family life. He's not getting on the best with his partner at times. Uh, they're doing their best to raise their kids, but obviously it's a difficult time. He's drinking way too much as well. He actually admits he's drinking too much and that it's having a negative effect on his relationships. Um, so it's not always the easiest of books to read, and again, it is essentially a pandemic diary. Um, I, I wrote in my review, published diaries don't often work, with the exception of Samuel Pepys and Alan Bennett, uh, and this one probably goes along that list, it does work okay. Um, just, it's not the best escapist reading, because it does have that claustrophobic feeling that the pandemic had, you know? But overall, I gave it a four out of five. I think it's the weakest of his books but still worth reading. Okay, then we have James Acaster's Classic Scrapes. Uh, and this is a collection of non-fiction by uh, the comedian James Acaster. It all started because he joined another comedian, Josh Widdicombe, on uh, XFM for Widdicombe's radio show, where he had a weekly spot where he talked about some of the awkward situations that he found himself in throughout his life. They eventually became known as his Scrapes, and he became the Scrape Master General. And this book's basically the written equivalent of that weekly spot. It actually has a bunch of the um, stories that he told on the radio, as well as a few others that were written for the book. Uh, and they're kind of just disparate stories, like the time he agreed to juggle as part of a performance as a kid, even though he didn't know how to juggle. Uh, one thing that stood out to me was the way he said, if you just stop to think, before acting, a lot of these scrapes would have happened, and I found that quite relatable because which of us hasn't ended up in trouble because of acting on impulse? Uh, Acast is very funny, and his idiosyncratic style and sense of humour comes across in the book in exactly the same way it does when you see him on TV, down to the point, the way that the writing reflects his tone of voice as well. Now, I haven't checked out the source material, but it would be interesting to see how different the book is to just being a transcript of what he said on the radio. Um, I also think it could be a pretty good audiobook if it's narrated by Acaster. I haven't checked it out, but I'm sure one probably does. But even just judging it as a book without that context of the radio show, uh, I think it worked really well and it was lots of fun to read while I was on the exercise bike. Uh, if I wasn't a fully fledged fan of James Acaster before, I am now. I gave James Acaster's Classic Scrapes by James Acaster a 4 out of 5. And that is all I've got for you for April 2024. I don't know what's happened to my reading, I've just not been reading as much as I used to. Back in the day I'd have like 30 plus books in my wrap up. These days if I've done 10 in a month that's uh, pretty good. But yes, those are all the books that I read in April 2024. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of these books, and if so, what you, if you've read these books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.